Yeah, Pyville has one, Fremont has two. We drove by your old house the other day. <clears throat> yeah, they fixed that up really nice. Yeah, they, um, they've made it so it's like at a two car carport now. Yeah. You know, they did the little driving, you know, sideway, side. Apron on there. Yeah, whatever you want to call it. We drove around the neighborhood a little bit, and that A frame house that's back there. Uh -huh. still for sale. No, there was no for sale sign. Really? Yeah. But it was, oh, we love that house. But, yeah, stopped in the middle of the road. I took a picture of it, but sure, if anybody saw me, they thought I looked crazy. It was a pretty house. I saw your picture. Mm hmm.
pray, God, your blessing for our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Probably as most of you know, Helen was born January 30th, 1922, Fort Blackmore, Virginia, to Charles and Ida Mae Hennigar. She lived to be 96 years young. I began to think about this a little bit. She was born in 1922. And so there's some folks here that may be a, a little more mature than I am. To just give a little bit of perspective of 1922. 1922 was the year that then President William Howard Taft dedicated the Lincoln Memorial. It was also the year that the tomb of King Tutankhamun uh, was discovered in the Valley of the Kings in Egypt. And 1922 was the year that Reader's Digest published its first magazine. What an incredible life Helen must have had. All of the new and exciting things that she saw over her lifetime, uh, we can only imagine. But no doubt any life that spans nearly an entire century should be and must be celebrated. And so the reality is for many of us today, we may never know or fully understand the remarkable experiences that Helen must have had. Growing up in southwestern Virginia and the east side of Tennessee, you know probably more than I do that she moved to Baltimore where she uh, was employed with numerous different jobs. Finally, she was uh, found employment with the Glen L. Martin Company, probably better known today as Mark Marietta. She worked assembling aircraft during the Second World War. Every time I think about that, Tom told me that many years ago, I get that picture in my mind, that famous picture of the lady who's wearing the, the headscarf and she's got tools in her hand, a little bit of grease, you know, on her face, you know. What, whatever the case, you know, those, those were people that were, that were supporting the war effort. But what I want to point out this afternoon was that Helen was a member of what has been labeled the greatest generation of Americans who have ever lived. Men and women who grew up during the Great, Great Depression, who fought war, the World War and whose efforts and labor helped to win that war. I'm told that she even had her own toolbox. Yep. A woman after my own heart. I've told my wife many times a man can never have enough tools. I guess in Helen's case, that fits too. I was never privileged to meet Helen. Uh, I do know she visited my home one time and I was not there. Um, amazingly, I've heard so many different stories about her. Uh, Teresa called her uh, affectionately Miss Daisy. I think she got it from the movie Driving Miss Daisy uh, because amazingly, Helen never learned to drive. I have to tell you, that's really something for a woman to live 96 years in the 20th and 21st centuries and never learned to drive. Really something. But despite the fact that she never drove, I understand she loved to ride. She loved to ride Harley Davidson motorcycles. Yep. And I'm told that she had no, no absolute uh, inability to express her disdain for those <laughs> foreign motorcycles. <laughs> she probably wasn't one to throw her leg over a jet bike, I've been told. So, as I began to think about some of this, I realized that Helen was likely a, a person of strong conviction. Conviction is, is more than opinion. Convictions come from strong beliefs, and, and, and more often than not, they're very strong, not just strong. And I believe this, that every life needs to have conviction in it. After marrying Charles in 1946, they were privileged to live in Georgia, North Carolina, Hawaii, and Virginia, all while serving in the United States Air Force. Again, what a terrific life. What a great opportunity this must have been for all of them. But like many women of her era, she enjoyed crafts, quilting, sewing, antiques, marching bands, reading, and making apple butter. She was a rock collector and an avid gardener. <laughs> I could see those things if someone in 96 years could get around to doing a lot of different things. But I think most of all, uh, what I've been told about her is she, like most people who lived through the, through the Depression, um, was a very thrifty person. Mm -hmm. Waste not, want not, I heard was her motto. <laughs> she must have had a very full life. But all of her many achievements, probably the most important was the fact that she was 
an extremely well accomplished backseat driver. <laughs> <laughs> I, told, I, I heard she even had a certificate stating that she was certified to drive the backseat. She would probably go along very well with my wife. Helen was married for 55 years. It's easy to see that a person who's married for 55 years is genuinely a person who believes genealogy and was able to track her family all the way back to 1650. I hope no one that old is here today. <laughs> but without a doubt, raising four sons can be problematic in any generation. Knowing Tom as well as I do, <laughs> I can imagine not only Tom as a child, but Tom as the baby. That obviously scared me. <laughs> but for Helen's life, commitment, conviction, and family. Those are, those are incredible attributes that we can talk about in any life. Qualities that we would all do well to have in our own lives. And so today, as we are here celebrating her life, I want to just take a moment to, to remind you, I would be remiss of, of my duties as, as a minister if I didn't talk to us for just a moment about eternity. The Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 14, he said, you do not know what life will be like tomorrow. You're just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Comparing our lives, the writer from the Bible says, to a vapor, it illustrates to us just how momentary our days on this life are. For all of us, for every one of us, sometimes life can feel endless and overwhelming. But the Bible goes to great lengths to remind us that human life is very, very minimal compared to eternity. It's like that vapor that is quickly chased away by the heat sun. I want us to understand that it's important that we recognize the brevity of life so that we don't squander the time that we've been given. The great psalmist wrote in Psalms 90 and 12, teach us, Lord, he says, to number our days that we may not obtain a heart of wisdom. God wants every individual, every person to live a life of purpose, recognizing that the clock is counting down to the moment when we too will step through death's portal and enter our eternal state. The truth is that no matter how much time we're given, death and eternity come for us all. I have a saying that I like to use. I tell folks once in a while in, in a little bit of humor, none of us get out of this thing alive. <laughs> certainly the truth of the matter that it always is. But we can understand what a vapor is. It's fine, like a, like a mist or even a fog. It quickly burns away when the sun is risen. And vapors usually, generally, they have no substance. But what I want to point out is that sometimes they leave behind not a substance, but more of an aroma. And so some of the the very few things that I've been able to share with you in just a couple of moments this afternoon about Helen's life, I pray that that, that that aroma of a life that has been well spent, a life that has been part of family and part of friends, this, this great many years of sacrifice and service and commitment and conviction chapter 15 verse 50 he said now this I say brethren that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God neither doth corruption inherit corruption he said behold I show you a mystery we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed 
For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. This corruptible shall have put on incorruption, this mortal shall have put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me again? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not